Okay, so this is our second class, and uh, I'll still use a chalkboard talk, and then next week we'll go over the slides, what we already talked, then give you an overview like a review. I pretty much talk about like 40 minutes, then we'll go to the lab, and the KC will show us how to use what activity meter. And Alec has a sample is ready for you guys, which is marinated with 1% and 3% salt and trisodium polyphosphate. Okay, so we're gonna talk about our section is the water. So I will say this water number one, and we will go over some of the material, then we mainly talk about water activity and also the moisture content. So first of all, water we should know, it is odorless. Tasteless. And uh, what's the color? Some people say transparent. Uh, I will say it is a little bit blue hue. So what that means, a little bit show the blue color. You can do an experiment by yourself. If you have a snowing day, when the snow is melted, you look at your glass, the window glasses, which is reflected in the light the sunlight, you will see sometimes a little bit of blue color there. So that's some people mention about the blue hue and a slight blue color of the water. It kind of surprised you when they first mentioned about that, but it's true. Now, second is, what's the function of the water? It is so important. Uh, without water, without life. So we don't need to emphasize it. Uh, we can say you have a bottle of water, uh, you need to drink, and then you're gonna have a, a like uh, alcohol products that everybody like, and then you have uh, fermented products. And we will talk about uh, the products from uh, fermentation. And we will be have several sessions talk about at the end of the semester. And uh, more important, we talk about the processing water. Uh, during the food processing, we need water. And we also need to have some time to extract the water to get like a protein and the other biological components. And also, if we want to take out of the water, we call it a dehydration. And then we put the water back, we call it a rehydration. So these are the things Related to the water, it is so important. Now, of course, it is a solvent. So it is so important. Okay. Now, the key here will be, what are going to be the molecule of the water? It is so easy, H2O. Everybody knows. So let's do some of the brief review what we talk about in our first class. What it really means? what the structure tells us. Okay, let's talk about the molecular weight. What is that? Two multiple by one, that is from proton, hydrogen, and uh, add 16, this is a mass weight, molecular weight from the oxygen, so that equals 18. It's simple. Okay, now what is the structure? You know, we have O at middle, we have H on the side. So, what are these called? This is called covalent bonds. Now, what is the distance between that, between the H and O, the proton and oxygen? 0 0.1 nanometer. Now, what is the angle? We call it a bond angle. What's the angle? 1.4.5 degree. Now, because it's connected with a covalent bond, so it's relatively strong. So therefore, the water molecule will not be easy to break down, except you connect it with the electricity. And then we also know that the oxygen has a strong electronegativity compared to the hydrogen. So therefore, sometimes we wrote it as cedar negative. This is cedar plus, which means 
they are more attracted with uh, electron. Now, how the water molecule are going to connect it with each other between water molecule and the water molecule? Then we will draw another one. Draw it using dots line, and here will be H, and then will be an O, and here will be another H. They connected with hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bonds, we said it's very weak. They could be break down. That's why water can be moving around. And what's the distance between the oxygen and the hydrogen? It is about 0 0.18 nanometer. So it's actually very close. Now, water molecule, if you look at the electron arrangement outside of this oxygen, it will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we know the outer layer is 6. And then it will be shared with a hydrogen. And then what we got left is these two pairs of long electrons. OK, so sometimes when you see the textbook, they will draw like this. A huge one, a huge one like that. This is the electron. These electrons are lonely. They are not connected with others. And because of this structure, so we also call it a polar structure. That's why water is a good solvent, an excellent solvent. And based on the material or the chemicals, like or dislike water, we could be separate them into two groups, which is we call hydrophilic, which means they like water. And we also could say it is hydrophobic. They don't like water. They like water, like lipids. This is called dislike water. And a good example, a very good example, will be something you learn in your biology class, will be a phosphate. Okay, so what it looks like. Remember, lipopolysaccharides. You have a head which is hydrophilic, and the tail is hydrophobic. And then they become a double layer. If you still remember, that's what we talk about in the biology class or the general microbiology class. And then you have a protein right in the middle. And this protein usually is a transfer protein. And we'll talk about this structure all the time. Okay, this is called the cell membrane structure. And this is basically its protein. Now, we want to go over also, uh, review a little bit the, uh, in relate to the electron arrangements. So, we talk about the electron arrangement of O is, we draw different boxes. If you still remember, that 1s, 2s, and uh, 2p. And they are following three rules. Number one, minimal energy policy. So always from low to high energy. Number two, we call it a poly exclusion policy, which means each of these orbital can be maximum occupied by only two electrons spin of the direction. Number three, we could say is Hans rules, which means all these electrons will be spin same direction and the do the singly occupied first, then they do a double occupied. So that's why it looks like this. So what it looks like? 1s2, 2s2, and 2p4. Okay. Now, how the water molecule are going to be really connected with each other? You look at the textbook, it tells you sp3 
hybrid. Okay, what the SP3 hybrid means? So you can look at this is a 2S. Let's go over it real quick. This will be a 2P. Okay, this is originally coming from which is a Mason CH4. Okay, then you run the opposite direction here, up, down, this is going to be up, up. Because carbon is 1S2, 2S2, 2P2. Now, when they do the hybrid, what they do? You see there is an empty orbital there. So that means one of the electrons from the 2s2 could be go there. Okay, so they go there. Therefore, if you connect it with them together, it gonna become. I usually draw like this, so it will become up, 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 and up. Then this hybrid called sp3 hybrid. And uh, we know that Mason group we draw already it looks like this. This is carbon. And uh, when we have the hydrogen is on the ends is like that. This is H. And we find this angle is about 1.9 degree. This is the water molecule is 1.4.5. It's very similar. So we know that CH4, the meso is sp3 hybrid. They will have a tetrahedral arrangement. And then we do the observation. We find the water molecule is similar. So water molecule, it is also tetrahedral, uh, tetrahedral arrangement. Okay, so these are the things we briefly review what we talked about the water molecule and the basic knowledge of the chemistry behind that. So next question, we want to mention something else. Did you ever heard about soft water versus hard water? You heard about that. Uh, in the United States, you can drink in just the tap water from the uh, any building in WVU. It's called the municipal water. The municipal water is soft water. Municipal water. Now what is hot water? Pound water and well water is hot water. Now, lots of people in the mountain area, is that right? Appalachian mountain area, they use hot water, just to use well water. They just use to drink or use to do the plantings or processings. Now, what's the difference between them? It's the difference is the calcium and the magnesium components and the level. Now, what's the standards for calcium and the magnesium? The maximum allowed concentration in the United States. It's not very high. The maximum around allowed range is 40 to 80 ppm. Let me double check it. Um, it should be, yes, ppm for the calcium. And the magnesium is 20 to 30 ppm. Now anything beyond that, we say it's hard water. Okay, if it's beyond that, we say it's hot water. Less than that is soft water. Now, hot water, we also want to mention the hot water can be have a two different categories. Hot water sometimes can become a soft water. So, we call it temporary. Temporary so hot water. How we do it? We do a boring. I'm not sure you do that. We do the boring. But sometimes it's permanent.
permanent. The boring will not solve the problem. It's still a hard work. There's not any work. Now, why are you using boring methods? Could remove the calcium and the magnesium in the hot water? Because the calcium and the magne magnesium is basically CaCO3 and MgCO3. What is that? Calcium bicarbonate and magnesium bicarbonate. Those we call it a weak. Is that right? We call it a weak salt, a weak acid composed of salt. When they dissolve into water, what's going to happen? Let's review your chemistry. What's going to happen? You have a calcium hydroxy going to be precipitated and generate what? Carbon dioxide to come out. The next one is magnesium oxygen uh, hydroxy will be precipitate and uh, carbon dioxide will be released. These will be cause precipitation. So did you find that if you use a hot pot to do the boring of the water, you use it often. Let's say you have a municipal water, you put a hot pot. Okay, you boil it. And then you throw them away, you drink it. You use that hot pot for uh, three months. What you gonna find? There's a lot, lots of the crust in there, is that right? Sometimes it's difficult to remove. What are they? That's calcium and magnesium there. Now, how come there is some of the calcium and magnesium components we cannot use boring methods to remove it? We call it a permanent hot water. Because it's instead of you have a calcium bicarbonate and the magnesium bicarbonate, you have calcium sulfide or you have calcium chloride. And the same thing, you have a magnesium sulfide and then you also could have a magnesium chloride. These are strong salts, strong acid made salts. It's not going to easily dissolve into water. Or have a biochemical reaction, we can say, or chemistry reaction. So that's why this is not going to be easily to using boring methods can solve the problem. Okay, so this is soft water and hard water. Now, remain the last question. I'm going to take, take this out because this is just give you some of the examples. Uh, we are bulk, uh, we are food chemistry class, but not really chemistry class. So the last one what I want to mention here is very important regarding to the food products is we call it a free water uh, versus bound water or we say bound water. Okay, what is a free water? Oh, obviously, K can be used as Sovereign, which means it can dissolve the something. Now, how you do you know it's a free water? There is a two methods you can do. Number one, using a filter paper. When you're using a filter paper on the filter paper, you will see some of the drips there. Okay, let's say you put a meat there on the filter paper. You remove the meat, what you see? So the water molecule will be there. The drip of the water there. Okay, let's say you put a meat in a field of paper. Then the water molecule is dripped is there. Second thing what you do, centrifuge. If you do a centrifuge, the water will be spin down. Uh, sorry, the water is not spin down. The other particles will be spin down. Then the water usually in this supernatant. That is the water. So you can separate it. How about the bound water? Bound water, there is two different things. Number one, obviously, this will be unavailable for as a solvent. 
Number two, even you using frozen methods, let's say at minus twenty degrees Celsius, it is unfrozen. That's a bound water. Okay. What are the examples of the bound water? How many components of a bound water in a food product? I gave you an example. If a meat product, about 10 to 11 percent is bound water. How about produce? Fruits and vegetables? Basically, fruits and vegetables is uh, water. 80 percent is water. That's that why you can make a smoothie. How many are bound water? Around 6 percent of bound water. Now, why we have a bound water in the food product? They are usually existing in the mono layer. Okay, then we're gonna mention that mono layer later on. Okay, so this is at the beginning, is we gave you some opening remarks. Talk about the basic knowledge of the water. Basically, is our textbook, I do some of the conclusion. Now, we will be spending time talking about the water activity. And I'm going to move on to right here. Sorry. I'll be right here. Then we're going to talk about it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can move it if, if you see okay. off the screen. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to talk about water activity. Now, before we talk about the water activity, there is another concept you need to know, is the moisture. Moisture content. It is a very important concept. A couple of years ago, when I asked a student, she's just doing a master degree with me. I asked her, I said, can you tell me what is water activity? She didn't even think, she said, that is a water amount in a food product. That answer is wrong. Well, her answer is means moisture content. Okay, so moisture content is very simple. Is water amount in Food products, I'll just say in foods. But is that so simple? Not really. Because there's a two different categories. So let's draw. Every food product, so let's say this is a food, okay? You all know that the food has different components. I will say we have a water component, it's right here. This red one is water. And the left one, I'll draw is this yellow one. This is solid. So the water amount in the foods, there is a two different category. Number one is the water amount divided by a solid component. This is we call it a dry base. Now obviously there is a second category, which is the water amount will be divided as a solid add a water, which means a whole food. Okay, a whole food. This is we call it wet base. So be careful when you talk about uh, moisture amount or moisture content. So that's why when you read a manuscript, read a paper, they sometimes they say 11% DRY dry. They write 10% WET. This tells you is that dry base and the wet base. Okay, so this is the first thing I want to mention. Now the second thing we want to talk about what activity? Okay, what 
activity we using AW to do the expression. What is that? There is a formula to do a calculation. Some people say it is called a partial vapor pressure above of water, or we say of water molecule, of water above a food product. To divide it by vapor pressure of pure water. And the vapor pressure of pure water, we most of the time call it 1.00. So therefore, you know what's the range of the water activity? Is between 0 to 1.000. So I gave you an example. Hot dog. If you measure hot dog, it's usually 0 0.995. If it's a beef jerky, It's a little bit low. Or some sausage salami is a little bit low, 0 0.912. How about those like a crispy products, like a biscuits, or maybe like a chips? That's low. That's going to be only maybe 0 0.350. That's called low moisture foods. OK? So this is the overall idea. What's that? Then the question you're going to ask me, what is called a vapor pressure? OK, then we have to explain to you. So how we do that? I usually draw is like this. This is what activity. So I draw above and below. I put a container there. This container is a closed vessel. And I put it on the right line. Let's say this is the pure water. OK, then you have H2O, 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 all these type of water molecules there. And you know the water molecule will be evaporated, is that right? It's going to be some going to be here. Yeah, that's going to be evaporated above this water line. But underneath, inside this closed vessel. So they're going to go up. But you also need to know some of the water molecules are going to go back. Is that right? They keep moving because they are connected by what water? Hydrogen bonds is not going to be very strong. They keep moving, come up and down. They will reach equivalent. 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 Which is the balance you can understand? Okay, when they reach that balance, the air up here will cause a pressure go down. What is called vapor pressure? Now, what's the key point to control the vapor pressure? Number one is temperature. Number two is pressure. So I'll give a very easy example. If I heat this, let me move this, move this up right here. If I'm going to heat it, I have a heat right here. I have a fire here. I'm going to heat it. What's going to happen? The water molecule will go out very quick. Is that right? It will go out. This is the atmosphere. Is that right? Atmosphere pressure. What is the world standard atmosphere pressure? 1.05 multiplied by 10 to the 5 Pascal. If you remember, in your physics class. If the vapor pressure equals atmosphere pressure, what's going to happen? That's called a boring. 
Is that right? Now, do you know the boring have something will be controlled as? What is the impact for control of boring? Temperature. Do you see the temperature? Uh, let's say degree Celsius. What is this? Time. Elevation. Is that right? When we talk about it here, it's 100 degrees Celsius. I'll take this out, it's just an example. It's 100 degrees Celsius, what is usually, it? what's that? Sea land. How about here? Maybe like a rocky mountain area or like an upper large mountain on the top of upper large mountain is not very tall. Rocky mountain maybe, is that right? That could be in rocky mountain maybe Maybe only like uh, 75 might be. So they cause a problem of food safety. You cook an egg. You maybe take five minutes to heat it. This you need longer time because otherwise it's not gonna be coagulated, not gonna be uh, killing the bacteria. Okay, so that's boring. Now, what other things we're gonna impact the boring? If you're gonna put the salt there and you put a sugar there, then the boring temperature will be increased, is that right? Mm -hmm. That's a common sense. So those are the things. The chemicals inside of the pure water and the elevation will impact the boring temperature. And that is the textbook which is mentioned about the boring temperature. You can look at that. Okay, now we're going to talk about the food products. We're going to go this up. Okay, right here, another closed vessel. Same thing. You gotta draw the line. Instead of you have a pure water, you have a food product. Let's say, Let's say this is a meat, a beef. Now of course meat has water. What else they have? They have sodium chloride, they have sugar, they have protein, amino acids, and they have the vitamins, minerals, all those things. What are they gonna do? They're gonna drag the water molecule, when you have salt there, these water molecules most of the time will not be go out. They sometimes go out here, okay, go here. However, because you have a sodium chloride there, so they're gonna close it. They're gonna drag them. Not let them go out as much as when you have pure water there. Therefore, the vapor pressure in here going to be less. Is that right? This is you divided by the two, you get what activity. And then, I want to also want to mention the, the uh, correlation between moisture content and water activity we talk about is the percentage of relative humidity and the relative humidity humidity is equals what activity multiplied by 100 that is also we call orange okay so this is what we explain the what is the water activity now the next question will be why water activity is so important in the food products this is we are gonna draw a big picture right here uh, I will be moving a little bit on the side. Uh, let's use this one, the red one. Okay. It's a figure. Y axis is moisture content. Use percentage. X axis is what activity? What gonna be the range? Zero, let's say to one. Zero, zero, zero. Okay, we're gonna split there. Zero point two five. Right in the middle, zero point five. Here, zero point seven five. Okay. I want to be draw some line. Now, 
Now, what is the relationship between uh, food's water activity and the moisture content? They correlated, but they are not linear regression, which means it's not straight. What it looks like? They are looking like something is like this. Little bit curve here, pretty flat, and very steep at the end. Now why? This is back down in 1950 or 1960. People think about the relationship between the moisture and the water activity can be categorized into three different uh, layers, which is number one is monolayer. In this monolayer, you will see the moisture amount of the water of the food is low and the water activity is also low. Then the second category, this is a little bit of difference. Some of the textbook call it additional layer. And some of the textbook call it capillary layer or loosely bound layer. I will just say this is loosely bound layer. In this, you will see the water activity is intermediate and the moisture amount is also intermediate. And I would say this curve in here, I will draw a little bit, a little bit up like this, a little bit up. How about the last section? This is free water. And the free water we also call it capillary water. So basically, the food products, the water components can have three different categories. Now, what are the examples? So I'll give you some of the examples of food products. Can you think about which food is low moisture and also low water activity? Chips, is that right? Which food right in the middle? Little bit of moisture, little bit of water activity. Dried fruit. Yeah, raisin. Dried grape. What's the last one? So simple, meat. Produce and fruits. Okay. Now, what the texture looks like? What are you feeling about chips? Is it dry? Crispy? Uh, crease your crispy. How about the reading? Chewy, is that right? A little bit moisty. How about meat and the produce? Soft. Meat, we talk about flavor, juiciness, and the tenderness. So it's very juicy. That's the texture. Now, what's the moisture amount in there? This first one is low, the last one is high, the middle one, raising, is intermediate. Now the last one is the stability. You can talk about the shelf life. We talk about shelf life. What is the shelf life of a chips? Forever. Of course it's long, yeah, forever long. How about meat and produce? Very short, is that right? You can put a meat in the room temperature for like three weeks, no. What are we then? No, right middle, intermediate, intermediate. Now then there's another question. You said you have so many examples. Why do we want to mention these? Because the quality of the food products highly relate to the water activity. 
And the, the well, we have different category based on the relationship between water activity and the moisture content, because there is three major, and actually four major biochemical or mycological reaction will happen in a different category regarding the food safety and the quality control. Any foods like chips fit a monolayer category. We are more care about is water reaction, is rain acidity. What's that? Lipids oxidation. Then the question is, what's the curve of going to be with lipids oxidation looks like? Lipids oxidation, the curve. Like this. At the beginning, very easy to have lipids oxidation. Right in the middle, not very high. Of course, at the end, the meat, we all care about it. This curve is lipids oxidation. Okay, I'll give you an example. Chips, we don't worry about chips too much about the bacteria grow. Although there is a low moisture uh, food, the, the bacteria passing control, the blah, blah, they'll talk about that. Basically, we don't care about that. When you eat a chips, you don't worry there's a bacteria there. But which one are you worried about? If the chips left, left on the room temperature too long, when you taste it, you feel it's about a little bit sweet. That's called a flavor reversion. A reversion. That's one of the example of lipids oxidation. So that's why we care about that. How about the products in the second category? The products in the second category, we can draw a line which is pretty much like this. What's that? Man reaction which is non-enzymatic browning. We will mention this in the protein section. A milk powder, when you put in the room temperature, it's going to change to the yellow color. That's in the non-enzymatic browning. What is enzymatic browning? You have an apple, you put in the room temperature, turns purple. That's enzymatic browning. So many other reaction is non-enzymatic browning. They are going to be at the peak value once you have a water activity about 0 0.6. They're going to strongly to happen with the main, main other reaction. So the second category, what we care about is main other reaction. Now, how about the last one? What we care? Well, that is our expertise. Bacteria are gonna grow. Is that right? And the foodborne pathogen. So that's why whenever the foods for the meat and the produce, what you're gonna to have to do? Sometimes you have to do canning, sometimes have you have to do pasteurization and the vacuum package, blah blah blah, blah all kinds of things which make sure it's food safety. Because in the last category, we more care about is bacteria and the foodborne pathogen grow. Now, although these products, also we have a concern really recently, in recent years, but more we concern about the meat and the produce. So that's why you hear about the news. All the outbreaks happen for the meat and the produce. You never see somebody say, the chips is contaminated with something, is that right? Barely you heard about that. That's the reason. So last one will be passenger growth. Now another thing we also want to say, we also going to draw another line, which is right here. This is enzymatic reaction. All the bad things could happen with enzymes there, or the residue enzyme in the food products. That is the reason. We want to draw this because the water activity of a food products, which is correlated to the moisture content, but not really strong. 
not really the linear regressional, it's uh, correlated. Because they will be related to the stability, the quality of the foods. Okay? So, what is your definition really for what activity? I'm telling you, if you really want to define what activity, don't remember the, you don't remember the formula, the equation how to calculate. Using layman language to explain, it is available water for biochemistry reaction and bacterial growth. So simple, bacterial growth. That's what we talk about is water activity, available water. Okay, so we're gonna end up here, we're gonna go to the lab, we're gonna test the water activity. Now, uh, next week we go over the slides, then we're gonna talk about the absorption and desorption of the water from a food. Uh, it's a lot so we can talk, and then we're gonna talk about the ice. Okay, so that's what we have today, and then we're gonna go to the lab. Are we not coming back in here? No. <laughs>